vill du ha den då? Jag väntar på det. Som eh, 90 sekunder eller något sånt så. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, good evening. My name is Kate Hansen Bund. And I'm the Secretary General of the Norwegian Atlantic Committee. And tonight it's my great pleasure on behalf of my own organization and Civita to welcome you all to what I believe will be a highly interesting evening. It is really great to see that so many people have found time to come here tonight in the midst of what's normally a very busy period of the year. And I can assure you, you are the lucky ones. Those on the long waiting list will have to tune in and listen to our streaming. As most of you certainly know, this autumn, it is 20 years since a rather unknown man, Vladimir Putin, became president of Russia. And we are going to discuss his rather long reign under the self-explanatory title from KGB agent to president, the rise of Vladimir Putin. To do that, we have with us three great experts on Russia and Russian politics. Each of them will be properly introduced later by our moderator and partner from Civita, Eirik Lecke. Please welcome him. The panel and the floor is yours. Thank you, Kate, uh, and good evening. And thanks to the Norwegian Atlantic Committee for co-hosting this uh, event, uh, uh, and as you understand we will do this in English. I'm sure many of you speak very well Russian, but some of us don't, so uh, we'll do this in, in English. Uh, we are live streaming this event, as Kate mentioned, so uh, welcome to everybody who follows us online on, on several platforms. I hope you can do that and have a very good uh, evening. Today's topic is Russia and Putin. And, uh, on New Year's Eve 1999, Boris Yeltsin resigned as president of the Russian Federation, leaving the office to his successor, Vladimir Putin, an unknown former KGB agent. Yeltsin had then been the leader of Russia since the collapse of the Soviet Union, a period characterized by tough conditions for the population. Putin took over a country in deep crisis, with a population ready for change. Various theories exist on Putin's rise to power. Putin is now in his fourth term as president of Russia. 2019 marks the year in which he has been in power for 20 years, making it a good opportunity to discuss how the country has evolved under his lead. And to share light on that topic, we have, as always, an excellent panel. Our keynote speaker is David Satter. He is a journalist and a fellow of the Foreign Policy Institute of the John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and a senior fellow of the Hudson Institute in Washington, DC. He is also the author of the recent book, The Less You Know, The Better You Sleep, 
Russia's road to terror and dictatorship under Yeltsin and uh, Putin. And uh, if you want to buy an edition of the book, uh, there's, possi there's possibility for to doing that uh, through an online order at the uh, bookshop here at Literature House. So if you're interested, just uh, make contact with them and they will help you get a copy. In addition to Mr. Satter, we have Pavel Bav, research professor at Prio, and an RK journalist and Moscow correspondent for many years, Morten Jentoft, uh, who will share some thoughts on today's topic. And in just a few seconds, I will end my introduction. But before I give the floor to David Satter, just some practical details. Mr. Satter will have uh, uh, 25 minutes for his introduction, followed by 10 minutes comments from Mr. Bav and Jentoft. After the introductions, we will have a short panel discussion, which I will lead, before we open up for questions from the audience. And if you want to register to the speakers list, please give me a sign, and I will recognize you accordingly. Please introduce yourself upon taking the floor and speak into the microphone, which colleagues from the Atlantic Committee will provide to you. I need to emphasize, as always, that we are opening up for questions or short comments, not additional speeches. So I ask you please to be brief. This meeting will finish no later than 7.30. So uh, I will make sure that we, we, we respect the time. My uh, final point, we urge you to share your thoughts on social media. And we have a Twitter hashtag for this meeting. Uh, we use when we have uh, evening meetings, Sivitakvel. But please remember to turn your mobile on silent uh, uh, modes. And one final thing that I've also been ordered to inform you about, and that is emergency exits, if something were to happen. We have three emergency exits, the door there, there, and there. And if the fire alarm or something happens, please just walk silently, not silently, but calmly to the, to the doors. We certainly hope that that will not be an interruption that happens. Well, so much for the practicalities. I'm very honored to give the floor to Mr. David Satter. Please take the floor. Thank you very much, Eric, and uh, thank you all for coming. I'm very glad to be uh, here in Norway again and uh, to speak to an interested audience about one of really the most important questions that faces the world today, which is the nature of the Russian regime under Vladimir Putin, the possible future of that regime, the events that led up to that uh, regime uh, taking power. Uh, and all of these questions are, in fact, in dispute. In many, in many cases, there's a, a real lack of information to this day about uh, who we are dealing with in Russia. What kind of person is this? What kind of regime uh, does he head? I think in order to answer those questions, we have to go back really to the very beginning, which is the fall of the Soviet Union. It was oftentimes not fully understood in the West that the Soviet Union wasn't, in essence, an economic system. It was uh, an answer to Western morality. It was a form of anti-morality. The core philosophical assumptions of the Soviet Union were based on the idea of class values. The idea that right and wrong were determined not by any kind of transcendent standard, as, is, as is, has always been supposed by Western philosophy, but rather by the interests of the working class. I mean, the Nazis, of course, uh, changed the uh, identity of the lodestar values. It became the master race, but the idea was similar. And, of course, it led to a totalitarian regime because there was no source of support for the individual and his integrity. When the Soviet Union fell, it was critical to establish the authority of universal values, in effect, the traditional values of the West. The idea that the individual has value, that all people in terms of their, of their essential worth are equal, and that, above all, 
the individual is not a cog in the machine of either the society or the state. In keeping with that task, with that fundamental task, what, was, what should have been the priority when the Soviet Union fell was the rule of law. Because only the rule of law can create the conditions in which the individual and his integrity are, are protected. But that's not what took place. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the group of, of young economists between the ages of 35 and 40, who became known as the Young Reformers, adopted the view that what was necessary was the radical transformation of the country's economic structures. They were in such a hurry to do this, and they were so concerned that the communists might come back and reclaim power, or that the people would not endure the hardships that they were about to impose on them, that they neglected entirely the importance of the rule of law. The important thing for the reformers was to take property out of the hands of the state, put it in the hands of indi private individuals. And if those private individuals were criminals, that didn't matter. They took the view, which was uh, advocated, in fact, by some Western economists, that the criminal, once he gained property, would, become a, would either become a law-abiding citizen or he would lose the property. Uh, <clears throat> in this respect, they, they paid very little attention to the massive corruption that enveloped the privatization process in Russia. And it's important to remember that what happened in Russia was the greatest peaceful transfer of property in, the history, in, in known world history never happened before because all of the property up until that point, or with a very small exception, was in the hands of the state. Uh, the process was advertised as an attempt to put property in the hands of the people. What happened, in fact, was that property was concentrated in the hands of a very small group with corrupt con connections to the existing regime. Uh, the various steps of that process are well known to scholars of, the, of, of, of Russia. Uh, it began with something called pro voucher privatization, which Russian citizens did not understand, and a few operators were capable of taking advantage of. It's followed by, ca by, by the sale of, of enterprises for cash, at auctions that were fixed. Uh, and uh, th then the loans for shares privatization program, in which the government basically handed, handed over the, the, the crown jewels of the Russian economy essentially to uh, already uh, government appointed oligarchs. Under these conditions, the, the, the newly rich in Russia established connections with the burgeoning criminal class. And in fact, it became often impossible to tell the difference who you were dealing with, a bandit or, 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 or a businessman. And sometimes they were one and the same. Oftentimes they were one and the same. This, this criminal oligarchy, which took power in Russia, was not interested in the economic prosperity of Russia. They were interested in stripping the assets. Uh, of the former Soviet Union. And in that respect, they succeeded admirably. The country, the, 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 the uh, uh, economic product, the national income uh, of Russia was cut in half. This didn't happen even under Nazi occupation. But the great, you know, people were not paid their salaries. To the extent that they survived, it was because they were able to Grow th that they, 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 they went out into the countryside to grow their own, f own food. In the late 90s, what we had in Russia was subsistence living in many respects. <coughs> and the greatest damage was done actually to the health of the nation. Russia suffered a drop in life expectancy that was so catastrophic that Western demographers, looking at the figures, uh, at first, simply could not believe it. Suddenly, Russia had the death rate of a country at war. 
the surplus deaths in Russia during the 1990s came to 6 million people. Surplus deaths, that's a, a technical term used by demographers to describe the mortality in a population that could not have been predicted on the basis of pre-existing trends. So the, the cost that the Russian people paid for the reforms was absolutely incredible. There was a, 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 um, a reporter went out to a new cemetery that was dug outside of Moscow. Uh, and he told, and he was told by the, the grave diggers, he said that, you see all these graves? He said that, the, you know, it, it was a vast field. He said, it's all young people. We never had that before. Um, there was a, I went to Vladivostok. There was a fisherman who stayed on the ice uh, despite repeated warnings that he could fall through the ice. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, the day after three people had drowned because the ice broke, and they finally, got, finally uh, managed, the, the police managed to get him off the ice and asked him, why in the hell did you go out on the ice when you knew that people were, had, had died yesterday in exactly the same situation? He said, I'd rather die than live the way we're living now. Obviously, under these conditions, the possibility of Yeltsin being re-elected in some way, shape, or form, although he was constitutionally limited uh, uh, to two terms in office, or the possibility that someone supported by Yeltsin would be elected president were very, very slim. Yeltsin went through five prime ministers before he hit upon a guy who no one had ever heard of by the name of Vladimir Putin. This, this, this guy had been the head of the FSB. He was unknown. He had no political experience. He was totally lacking in personal charisma. None, and his popularity rating uh, upon being named prime minister was 2%. Now, sociologists will tell you that in any poll, 6% of the respondents don't understand the question. So it's a, uh, there's a real, there's really doubt whether anybody in Russia supported him. But I was in Moscow in, uh, in the summer of 1999 at a time when there was a real feeling of crisis in the air. Uh, there were rumors that something big was going to happen. People suspected that Yeltsin would not give up power peacefully. Uh, and that, in fact, there was too much criminal activity to with, that f with which he could be charged. And that there some excuse would be found to, to declare martial law. One, one, one rumor was that, there was that building, government buildings would be blown up. Another rumor was that some well-known people would be taken hostage and and uh, you know, publicly tortured or killed. Another rumor was that there would be a war in Moscow between criminal gangs, and that would be used as an excuse. Nobody was sure exactly what was going to happen. And then apartment buildings in Russia began to be blown up, first in the city of Buenovsk, then in, uh, on Ulitsa, in Guryanova Street in Moscow, and then on the Kashirskaya Chasse in Moscow. People were murdered in the middle of the night, as they slept, about five in the morning, bombs placed in the building, it created massive panic, was used <coughs> in order to create an excuse uh, for a renewal of the war in Chechnya. Barbaric methods were used in Chechnya, including banned weapons, uh, in what was supposedly an anti-terrorist operation. And uh, Putin's popularity began to rise. He was suddenly no longer the stooge put in, put in power by a corrupt president who was universally hated. He was now the savior of the nation who was defending the, the Russian people against an insidious attack by terrorists who, blew up, who murdered them as they slept. Needless to say, the, the political situation changed overnight. Putin became the leading candidate, and in fact, he was elected president. 
But there began soon to be doubts as to what had happened. And the most important event was what happened in the city of Ryazan, southeast of Moscow. In, that, in, in Ryazan, a bomb was found in a, f in a building. This would have been the fifth bomb, the basement of a building. And it was diffused because it's one, of the, one of the residents of the building saw suspicious activity. People who put the building were caught, put the bomb in the building were caught. Uh, and they turned out not to be Chechen terrorists. They turned out to be agents of the Federal Security Service. That was the agency that Putin headed had until recently and uh, was, uh, you know, as we know, the secret police of, of, uh, of Russia. The, the, in, the head of the FSB said that, well, this was a training exercise. The bomb was phony. But in fact, the bomb was tested positive for hexagon, the same high explosive that was used in the other bomb, the successful bombings. The, 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 for a day and a half, the, the bomb was in the custody of the Riazan police. It was time-stamped, photographed, and it, uh, experts determined that the detonator was alive. Uh, under the Russian law, if there's a training exercise, then ev all local officials involving civilians, all local officials have to be notified. None of them knew, including the local branch of the FSB. Uh, the car that was used in the bombing was stolen. That would not have been the case if it had been a legitimate training exercise. In fact, they wanted to blow up a fifth building. And that building was located on an unstable hill, on an unstable ground at the top of a hill. Ha there were 400 people li who lived there. 300 people had already been killed. That building had been blown up. It would have hit the surrounding, the, the next, the neighboring building, I'm sorry, uh, which was next to it with the force of an avalanche and taken that building as well. Another 400 people. So there would have been, that would have been the most deadly terrorist act of all. It didn't happen, but just like, it, but as if by clockwork, the Russian uh, uh, Air Force began bombing Grozny, the capital of, of of uh, Chechnya, the uh, breakaway republic, uh, because you know the obvious. It, it was obvious to me that that was the plan: that the bombing would take place in the wake of a successful uh, of a successful explosion. Well, the explosion didn't take place; the bombing took place anyway. There were further events. Uh, the speaker of the State Duma in Russia made a speech after the third explosion, the building on Kashirskaya Chasse in Moscow was blown up and he said, I have information that a building in Volgodonsk was blown up. The building was blown up three days later. Uh, no one has ever been able to explain how he knew three days in advance that the building was going to be blown up. So the, the long and short of it is that the evidence is overwhelming that Putin would have never come to power except for the fact that there was a well-planned series of terrorist acts carried out by the regime against its own people. Now, we, I, what does that tell us about today and where, what conclusions can we, can we draw about Russia? We've had numerous examples since the apartment bombings of the barbarous attitude of the, of the Russian leadership toward their own citizens. The theater siege in 2002 when the audience was, a, was when the, the theater was take, taken over by terrorists uh, and uh, many of whom had just been released but from prison by the authorities and then uh, the, the members of the audience were killed when the, when the theater was flooded with poison gas which still hasn't been identified or 2004, the Babeslan school massacre, where a, a, a gymnasium full of parents and children was attacked with flamethrowers and grenade launchers, again during a terrorist attack, but the, but the, but the casualties were, uh, were the result of official government action. And uh, the, the murders of Alexander Litvinenko, uh, 
Anna Politkovskaya Russia's outstanding in, uh, investigative journalist, Boris Nemtsov, the leader of the opposition, who spent time here in Oslo, and the shooting down of the Malaysian airliner. Uh, so with this kind of attitude, uh, this disrespect for human life, this kind of total cynicism in the application of power, uh, what ought we to do and, and what should we be aware of uh, as far as Russia is concerned? If first of all, I think it's important that this type of mentality be resisted and we not make excuses for it. And that if in, in, in situations of doubt, as there inevitably will be in, a, in dealing with a country which controls all information and is dedicated to falsification, uh, that, the, that the presumption of, of innocence does not apply. The presumption of innocence is an Anglo-Saxon doctrine intended to protect the individual against the, against the state, not to defend the state accused of a mass crime against individuals. The, um, the, added, the, the, con the, 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 the goal of the West, of the Western countries, of the United States, of the NATO members, Norway, and, uh, and our, our allies, uh, should be to insist on the truth in dealing with Russia. And this is very important for the future, because a, a regime like the, the, the what exists in Russia that is based on manipulation, corruption, selective terror, and, and uh, total, the total control by a small group of power and property is inherently unstable. And we know from history that uh, regimes of this kind will eventually be challenged. The great da danger to the West exists not only in Russia can what Russia can do to the outside world, but what the Russian regime may do to its own people. 1991, August 1991, there was a coup in response to the democratization of the country and, threat and threatened breakup of the Soviet Union, led by communist hardliners. They had the 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 Russian civilians, Soviet civilians, gathered around the building of the Russian parliament to defend it against a possible attack. In Tiananmen Square, thousands were murdered in similar circumstances. In 1991, the coup leaders did not have the wherewithal to commit a mass crime because the truths that had been that had been revealed as a result of glasnost, glasnost had discredited the Soviet ideology. And you need an ideology in order to carry out a mass crime. For the sake of the future, it is important that the present Russian regime be disarmed of the lies about its own atrocities and that the people of Russia and the people of the world be aware of what they've done. Under those circumstances, if there is a confrontation like the one that took place in August 1991, we can hope that the instruments of violence will not be effective in putting down mass protests and that Russia can have, has, has, will have a path to a better future, a better, more democratic future, and a less criminal regime. Those are the thoughts that I wanted to share with you 20 years after uh, Putin came to power. And of course, I, I welcome your questions and the, and the questions and comments of my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for these insights, uh, Mr. David Sadler. So I'll uh, give the floor to Pavel Baev. Please, the floor is yours. Just be seated if you want. Thank you very much. I, I hope the mic works. It's my great privilege to share this uh, um, event with David, whom I know for many long years, whose work I deeply respect. And I do remember the impression which his book this book has made on me uh, 15 years ago. 
and I found nothing I could disagree with in the book, but I wanted to hope that David was painting it to black, like that. <laughs> that he's going too far in uh, presenting Russia's uh, trajectory, and in some ways he was going too far. He was speaking about Russian economic uh, dislocation, disaster, and crisis. And in the years when the book was published, Russia was suddenly gaining economic dynamism, was showing growth, was showing signs of prosperity, which was trickling down. And yes, certainly since then, there was a crisis in the year 2008, sharpened uh, uh, deep, but it was a rebound. But and then it was another crisis in the year uh, 14 and 15, uh, and now we have a long stagnation, which certainly is, an, uh, is not a healthy economic situation, but it's not unique to Russia. Many economies around the world are not in a very good shape, and yes, Russia is stagnating and incomes are again falling, but it's nothing resembling the catastrophe uh, of the 90s. So all in all, Russia isn't doing that bad economically. David was also speaking about the demographic crisis, which was indeed acute in the 90s, but when the book was published in the early 2000s, it was gradually getting better. Uh, and life expectancy was growing and public health was somewhat improving. It is still far from normal uh, demographic situation, particularly because there is a lot of outflow uh, from Russia, out migration, but there is also in migration. So all, all you look at the kind of demographic situation, it's not really that uh, dramatic. But where David was exactly right was in his warning about dictatorship, that the original crime committed by the Putin's regime at its very beginning in, the, in September 1999, uh, 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 condemns this regime to kind of growing into real uh, full-blown uh, dictatorship. And that was a prophecy which was hard to accept, hard to swallow, both inside Russia and outside. Nobody really wanted confrontation with Russia. It is too important part of the European security system, too important neighbor for many European states. Uh, nobody was kind of looking forward to another crisis in the relationship. And when it happened in the year 14, many were taken by surprise, as if out of nowhere. In, 15, in February of the year 14, the, main, the meaning of the Russian threat was that Russia would beat Norway on the ski tracks in, in Sochi. And in March of the same year, suddenly it was Crimea and aggression against Ukraine, and then very ugly war in Donbass and Boeing and all these sort of things, out of nothing apparently. No, it wasn't out of nothing. It was really a very natural process of uh, maturing of that, of that regime, a uh, very natural trajectory. And where this regime is now, I think one voice which captured very, uh, very clearly the essence of this regime uh, was the voice of Yegor Zhukov, a young student uh, who is on trial in Moscow uh, for extremism. And yesterday he had his last word. The only freedom of speech which still exists in Russia is the freedom of last word in the court. And his you know, two main, two key words in that speech was love and responsibility. That's your kind of a measure of Russian extremism for you. And probably tomorrow he will be found guilty. And he was speaking about uh, of life in Russia, and one of his points was that the only institution which is really strengthened, invested in, which is really in the center of this regime, is autocracy. The same, essentially, dictatorship David was speaking about. Uh, but uh, Igor Zhukov also made the point that it's kind of defective dictatorship, because in that dictatorship, uh, there is so much corruption that it cannot function effectively. It cannot really resort to massive repression because it's corrupt through and through. 
Corruption is not a byproduct or a side feature of this regime. It is its very essence. Uh, it kind of, it's, uh, it, that's how it lives, that's how it survives. And yes, in that, it is certainly uh, a heritage from the, from the 90s, from uh, the mistakes and blunders uh, committed by the, uh, by the young reformers. Uh, but this corruption by now has required really grotesque uh, forms. It is really going beyond every uh, reasonable border. Prime Minister Medvedev was giving a press conference, one of his uh, kind of ritual things uh, the other day, and kind of the main questions which were kind of uh, addressed to him but never asked. You can saw them on the, uh, on the kind of TV which were kind of presenting questions coming by SMS and by internet. Uh, all the questions were about the private jet his wife owns. And certainly it's impossible to kind of put, uh, put that uh, question formally, but that's what the public opinion is, uh, is really interested about, about all these grotesque features of this corruption. And it also tells you that uh, this dictatorship can't really control uh, the uh, virtual space, so to say. Uh, there was so much talk about uh, censoring the internet, about really kind of shutting down all the social networks, uh, all the independent voices in these networks, and some uh, bits and pieces were done, but the regime is unable really to, uh, to do that. It's too corrupt really to, uh, to go uh, seriously, uh, to invest uh, coherent eff effort in that. Russia is not a great uh, cyber power. In many ways, it's probably more a cyber hooligan and uh, internet remains uh, really uh, uh, gives you a picture of the very different Russian society and propaganda paints. Certainly this corruption is not, uh, how to say, entirely innocent. Uh, it's, it probably condemns this regime uh, to dislocation and that's why Igor Zhukov was so confident, uh, smiling about his, uh, his future but it, we also need to remember that the export of this corruption is a, a imp very important instrument for Russian foreign policy. It's really a weapon uh, which uh, Russia is using, particularly in relations with Europe. Uh, the outflow of this dirty money into many European states, uh, into real estate, into bank accounts, into all sorts of uh, ownership, is a serious security challenge for Europe with which it's very difficult to deal. In many ways, it's far easier to deal with Russian spies and agents, uh, dangerous as they are, uh, ready to commit uh, ugly crimes as they are, but they are also so kind of unprofessional and leave so many trails that uh, they are, in most cases, caught red-handed. And the most recent crime in, uh, committed in Berlin uh, this summer is now coming to, uh, to, uh, to uh, cast another shadow on Russian life. But the export of Russian corruption is a serious thing. And in many ways, the, the, uh, many European authorities investigating uh, kind of the crimes committed by the FSB are suddenly becoming very reluctant to go deeper because the Russian investments are too important in the London Stock Exchange, in, uh, in real estate in France, in Cyprus, where so much Russian money is, is hosted. So that, um, uh, that side of, of Putin's regime, uh, which was already kind of present in the, uh, in the nutshell at the very beginning, but it was, uh, it's now so much more and goes so much deeper. I think that is also something uh, David uh, pointed out very, very clearly in, in his books. And it is some, it's one part of the reality of confrontation with Russia we need to deal with. And this confrontation is not going to go away. There cannot be really uh, a restoration of confidence and rebuilding of trust with Putin regime for which many in the West hope which kind of every now and again we, uh, we hear demand. Um, this regime is of such nature uh, that it, uh, it is kind of doomed to uh, continue on the track of confrontation with the West until it will expire. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, doomed for
for confrontation. It's tough words, of course. Uh, on Monday, there will be a very important meeting in Paris about uh, Ukraine, and uh, it will be very interesting to see what will happen at that meeting, because um, that will be, for those not informed, the first meeting in three years at a high level about the Ukrainian crisis. It will be the first meeting between uh, Vladimir Putin and the new president of uh, Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky. And uh, it will also be the first meeting after we had heard um, Emmanuel Macron talking uh, about uh, the need for building new relations with Russia, as you were talking about. So uh, this meeting on Monday, uh, uh, for me as a journalist, will be very, very interesting. Um, we can come back to that later, but uh, uh, it will be interesting to see uh, what can Putin offer, how far is he willing to go now to get uh, um, uh, to, to come clo uh, closer to a solution of this crisis in Donbass. Um, okay, I can talk more about that um, later, but um, a little bit back to the 90s. Uh, I came as a correspondent to Moscow in 96, uh, in the summer of 96. Uh, all the West were then doing what they could to support uh, Boris Yeltsin, the re-election uh, of him, together with the uh, these uh, uh, young reformers, and many afterwards, we I have been thinking about that. Of course, uh, many thought, oh, getting Zhugano uh, back as, as a president, the communist, what could that be? We, okay, we have to support this ailing uh, Yeltsin. But afterwards, I have been thinking about that. This was not the real uh, election. This was um, rigged, these elections, and um, was it wrong? than to support this ailing Yeltsin in this election. Uh, is uh, in many ways then um, the West, all the journalists, are we also responsible for what happened? Because this election was, uh, uh, of course, in many ways uh, awful what happened then. Uh, and then uh, Yeltsin was re-elected and went straight to the hospital for another uh, bypass operation. <laughs> So uh, um, uh, it's, it's interesting to talk a little bit about the West's role in this, uh, where, where we as journalists in that, at that time. And then, of course, um, came um, the rise of Putin. I was uh, uh, also in Moscow at the 25th of um, July in 1998. And in the evening there, I was sitting at the Norwegian Radio and TV's bureau in Moscow, and then I got the message that uh, there was a new head of the FSB, uh, the secret police in Russia, and that was uh, Vladimir Putin. And I remember very well, uh, uh, I called back to the uh, foreign news desk in Norwegian Radio and TV, where me and Christian were working at that time, and okay, maybe we should have a, a small news about this new boss of FSB. That could be of interesting. Uh, and I, I mentioned the name Vladimir Putin. And I remember very well, I should not mention his name now, but very, uh, very well-known colleague of us, and he said, Vladimir Putin, no, he was, we have no picture of him. We can't, th th this will be not be in use this evening, so we go on. And of course, I have talked to him many times afterwards, then, um, because uh, uh, Vladimir Putin was, of course, very unknown at that time. But, uh, and even in, uh, one year after, in uh, August, the 12th, I think it was, in uh, 1999, I was also at work. And then uh, we were talking about, uh, this was, as you said, the fifth uh, or sixth president, uh, the prime minister under Boris Yeltsin, and the name was also Vladimir Putin. And we were talking about him again then with, uh, at the news desk in Oslo and said, oh no, another one, wow, is, is that interesting? But uh, of course it was interesting because at that time, there was a big article, I, don't, I think it was in Commerçant, uh, which actually uh, laid the ground for what happened uh, later, where there was a document presented as how to rebuild the Russian state, the Russian idea. And uh, I, I read the article, and it was very interesting, but I didn't make a story about it at that time. But actually, that was uh, uh, the... the the, the election of uh, Vladimir Putin as a prime minister, that was not a coincidence. It was actually planned for quite a long time from forces um, uh, 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 around the security services. And uh, um, uh, 
what happened afterwards was actually well planned, and I think you are right in many ways that this explosion, I remember, I was, I, I was living not far from the Kashyyyskaya Chaussee, I heard that, the explosion. But you didn't mention one very important thing, that before the explosion, there was uh, these events between uh, Chechnya and Dagestan, uh, uh, where the, with Shamil Basayev, uh, one of the leaders of the, the Chechen Republic, attacking the neighboring country. And that was actually the start of all these events. And uh, I think you a little bit under the situation in Chechnya, which, uh, which is a conflict I covered very, very extensively for many years. And we, as journalists, maybe didn't understand very well that there was a rise of a, a Islamic extremist in that region. But of course, uh, uh, this was as a gift for, um, for Putin and FSB and for the forces in Moscow that wanted to re-establish some kind of national pride. I was in, uh, in Chechnya in August 1996, and actually I saw an um, empire actually with the feet on the ground at that time. It was so uh, depressing to meet the Russian soldiers standing outside Grozny. They had lost the control of the Chechen capital at that time. They were drunk, they were dangerous, uh, and, and they was actually that was really um, uh, the time when, the, when Russia, the Russian statehood, was at their feet at that time. And afterwards, many people were talking about how to get the, the country up again, and this was the time. The August, uh, uh, the events in uh, uh, the autumn of '99 was, of course, uh, that laid the ground for Vladimir Putin coming up. But nobody of us uh, working in Moscow at that time uh, really understood what happened. And maybe, maybe uh, uh, the people around Putin and the people who wanted to re-establish, rebuild the Russian state actually didn't know how it should develop. I don't know. And when uh, I have heard later that Yeltsin himself was also not sure about what, uh, where this was going, but then he got the guarantees that um, uh, he would not be punished, uh, and uh, that was the time. And I remember very well, I was sitting at the uh, uh, Norwegian radio and TV editing a story for the Millennium events, and then there came the, the news, okay, Yeltsin uh, has resigned. And I was thinking, okay, he has said before, he has resigned. And then it was actually uh, true, and we saw Yeltsin leaving the office, and a few hours later we saw Putin uh, in uh, Chechnya together with his troops. And then what was the start of the rise of, of, of Putin's regime, of course. Uh, uh, okay, you uh, painted a very uh, dark picture of what's going on, what the situation in Russia is for the moment. I, I've been living in Moscow now for four years. Um, what should I say? Uh, living in Moscow, uh, the life is uh, getting better all the time. New lanes for bicycling, a lot of restaurants. People are not very unhappy, not very happy, but things are... Uh, I think most people are thinking that, okay, there is a stability, things are going some way in the right direction. Uh, the sanctions from abroad is positive for Russia because now we are producing our own food. Um, I think you should be very carefully to paint everything black and white now. Uh, I agree with you, there are a lot of negative things going on in Russia <coughs> when you are talking about uh, democracy, press freedom and so on. And I think um, someday, someday Putin's regime, the regime around Putin will fall. Um, most of all because he has built this regime around himself. It's so dependent on one person. And uh, as, uh, as, for example, one time during my last four years, there was a time when Putin was away from, uh, from uh, f uh, for some reason. There were, of course, a lot of rumors what he was going on. Or but then, okay, the suddenly the society began to, to shiver. Uh, the business uh, society was afraid, what's going on, who is taking decisions, and so on. And this is the real danger of the Russian society that today. I don't think, as far as Putin is in control, nothing will happen. But someday, he, he won't be 
able to, to maybe you don't want anymore to, 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 to rule this country. And that could happen. I have seen uh, uh, some pictures of Putin, uh, of a man who is not that strong anymore. And people in Russia are very afraid of that. But as far as Putin's, Putin is in charge, I think nothing will happen. The opposition, okay, Igor Zhukov and all this, I admire them. And they are looking for a better future, as, mm, as we can see, people between 18 and 24. Uh, or, or the, the last uh, survive by Levada shows that I uh, think about 50% uh, of them are willing to emigrate, which of course is a catastrophe for a society. And for, for, uh, but that's, that's the situation. But it's not a threat to the Putin's regime for the moment. So um, we will see. Mm, uh, the situation in Russia uh, could suddenly change, as you say, but I think you should not think of a very, uh, as, as I know Russia now for living there for five, four years, uh, many experts are talking about the regime will soon fall. I don't think so. I think it will not fall very soon. The support for Putin as a, as a person is very strong, and it's not an imagination, it's a true. When you go around in Russia talking to people, people are, uh, of course, very not satisfied with the economic situation and so on, but they are supporting Putin. They are supporting him. So um, I think we, are, we will not see uh, uh, a big dramatic change in the very, very near future. But everything depends on one person, and that's Vladimir Putin. Thank you. Thank you, Montenegro. Thank you all for great introductions. I will very soon open up for, for q and A's. I already noticed one uh, gentleman uh, wanting to come on the list. I noticed you, uh, but just a couple of questions from me. And I, I think I'll start with you, Njentov. It was an interesting point you make, and that is somewhat debatable. Certainly, I hear the debates about, can you trust the polls about Putin? How popular is he? And if you ask people, are they afraid to say what they really feel? Of course, you have been there many times, but yeah, how would you? to say what they mean. That's what we are thinking about. That, oh, no, they are pressed to say this. I think the support for Putin is uh, actually real. You can mm. like it or dislike it, but it's real. And uh, you can say, OK, they are, they are not very well informed. They only get their information from, uh, from TV and propaganda and so on. Well, OK, they do that. But uh, I think the support, and I think the support is quite it's more than 60% all the time. Okay, it's been going down now. Mm. It was all time high during the election last year, six, uh, 76%. But it is very strong mm. when you are talking, Poppy, and also it's very strong among people in the big cities too, although the young generations, are, there are many who are uh, dissatisfied with Putin. Mm. But uh, this idea, many people in the West are creating that, uh, oh no, it could not be true, it could not be true, people are not supporting Pu Putin because they are not well known. Russians are following news. Russians are not, they are, they are reading a lot. Mm. I think it's, uh, 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 this, this, uh, the, the many people are thinking that the Russians are idiots and not following the news. They are in many ways more, in more informed than us. They are reading more. But they are supporting Putin. Mm. <laughs> <It's> uh, <laughs> well, like yeah, it or not. I think that, uh, yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, there are, there are uh, strange things can happen in elections. I mean, in your country, uh, Mr. David Satter, there was also uh, a, a president that people couldn't <laughs> can't find hard to believe that people would support Mr. Mr. Trump. So what, how, how would you explain the popular support? Or do you agree that there is popular support for Putin and the Putin regime in Russia? Uh, yeah, I do agree that there is popular support. So the question is, how do we explain it? Uh, you know, I, 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 I remember an incident that took place when I was uh, correspondent uh, for the London Financial Times in, in, in Moscow during the Soviet period. And I was uh, standing in a line in a store for potatoes. And in front of me, uh, a guy in the line started shouting. He said, how long can we, can we tolerate these lines? This is just unbearable. And a woman who was in the line turned to him and said, never you mind, the whole world is afraid of us. And uh, the, uh, 
you know, and this is this was not an accident. I was just reading a biography of Alexander II, the Russian liberator czar, and and uh, uh, Nicholas the first in the first half of the 19th century said, "We want to be able to terrorize the world." And after the Soviet Union fell, and uh, so, and it became 15 separate countries. Uh, one of the great, you know, one of the great psychological compensations for Russian people was lost. I mean, many Russians understood that they, they, they would say, well, yeah, we live worse than people in the West, but we are part of a great state. And this state is bringing enlightenment and so on, the benefits of communism to the whole world. Hmm. I mean, this is a psychology which was very, very deeply ingrained. And during the 1990s, when it seemed that no one was afraid of, 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 of Russia, uh, people felt humiliated. So the, obviously there was a, a, cycle, a, a vacuum, that, that an emotional vacuum, that uh, could be filled, and it was filled. First of all, because the country began to be prosperous, uh, partially because of the, raw, the ra rise in raw material prices, but also because through, you know, through the various barbarous methods that were employed, nonetheless, a, a capitalist uh, economy was created, so they could take, take advantage of that boom in, materi in uh, raw material prices. But but at the same time, uh, you know, Russia began behaving very assertively mm -hmm. in its foreign policy, more assertively, and this had this had a you know deep appeal for a a a, a, a nation that for generations had uh, been accustomed to thinking of itself as a great power that could intimidate other countries. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and and the uh, Russian. The first thing that Putin did when he came, came to power was to take over state television. And the state television is the principal means of information, source of information for Russians. And it is totally censored and totally controlled. And, but more important than the censorship is the fact that the, the, the people who are in charge, they understand the psychology of their own people. They know how to manipulate. And uh, the final factor was that suddenly Russia began to experience an economic boom. And that economic boom was something that for ordinary Russian people was just something fantastic. Under, under, under Yeltsin, they, we they went months and even years without getting their salaries. Suddenly their salaries were being paid and they were going up. And uh, Russians, had waited for really generations hmm. for Western type prosperity. I mean, they still don't have quite Western type prosperity, uh, except in a few major cities. Yes. But 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 they be, but li life got a lot better. Right. I was always I you know I've been going to Russia for years until I couldn't go, and as a result of being expelled. But in I I always thought of Russia as a very poor country. But in the under under Putin in two thousand in the two thousands, Russia began to begin to show the signs of Western style prosperity. So all of these reasons, all of these things, began affected the the psychology of people, and they began to use the image of the West as an enemy, mm. just as they used the Chechens as the enemy in order to get power. And they've used terrorist acts in order to convince the Russians that they're still under attack. Mm. They've depicted the West and the U.S. and the NATO as enemies in order so that people will not think. And, and under the conditions that exist there, it's a, they don't think, for the most part, although there's a minor minority that does. I, th I think we can get also back to the, uh, to the West. I just want to bring in Mr. Pavel Baev, also with the... Um, um, from a, from my skeptical point of view, though, to to I even though that Motnyantov says that it's true, that it's popular support. But uh, a question would then be: If you're 
popular support is big, why do you have to rig an election? I think many of us Westerners ask that question. What, what would you say? Would, would Putin win an election that was free and fair? Yeah, it, there are elections and elections, and certainly the protests in Moscow this summer yeah. were about elections were rigged in a new way, so to say, without any um, access of opposition, uh, opposition candidates. And I think that uh, it's very difficult sometimes to catch the shifts in the atmosphere. Uh, support for Putin was solid for so many years that we still take it for granted, and he takes it for granted. And suddenly there are kind of uh, changes and opinion polls don't really show them because would you imagine yourself, you're sitting eating your dinner, uh, telephone calls, uh, a voice you never heard say uh, it's an opinion poll, do you support President Putin? And what would you answer? <laughs> and 30% <coughs> say they don't. <laughs> that's uh, it's that's a, courageous. Yeah, that's <laughs> in, uh, incredible in, in many ways. And uh, you know, a feature of this regime is sometimes it's supremely confident in public support. It controls the television, as was rightly said. The only thing is that television now uh, loses to internet as a main source of information. It's less and less people have uh, watch it and has, uh, have, have confidence in that. And that regime lives in fear. It suddenly, this support which was so solid yesterday disappears today. Mm. And that fear drives many overreactions, many stupid blunders, many, particularly since it's so personal, everything depends upon one person. And his idiosyncrasies and his moods and his disappearances, as I was mentioned, is also important. Uh, and uh, so I don't think that uh, we can suddenly, uh, one morning, wake up and Putin evaporates in the thin air. I think much greater risk is that uh, we wake up and discover how uh, Putin made another uh, grave blunder as I think uh, the annexation of Crimea, uh, in, a, um, uh, in a sense, is, is a very serious blunder, probably driven, again, by the fear of what, what was happening in Kiev. Um, so I think that uh, I see as a lot of unpredictability uh, in the apparent stability of this regime. Before I give the, uh, give the word to, to Matnyantov, I just want to repeat the speaker's list. I have noticed the gentleman behind there and the gentleman there. And there's also uh, opportunities for others to come on the speaker's list. And I urge you to do it sooner rather than later. We try to end at 7.30 or we shall end at 7.30. Please, Matnyantov. Yes, uh, talking about the elections this summer, the local elections, for example, in Moscow, this is a very good example what I mentioned before. Because uh, the regime... Uh, is so dependent on one person. And that's why, for example, uh, the United Russia, the party of Putin, is so unpopular that they actually uh, were trying to hide the candidates during this election. And they knew that this would be a problem in the local elections. And that's why uh, they tried to, uh, to, to stop some of the independent candidates then. But this, uh, uh, this doesn't change uh, my words about the support for Putin as a person, of course. But it's, it, it shows that the regime is in many ways so weak. And Putin is responsible for this himself because he has built the regime around himself. He is taking every decision uh, from pardoning Fru uh, de Berg <laughs> to make uh, what they should do with Ukraine. It's only him who are making the decisions. And this is, of course, a very weak regime in many ways, but as long as Putin is strong, people trust him because they don't know what is coming after him. And people are very afraid. I was in Moscow in August 98 and uh, uh, saw people crying on the street, losing all the money in one day uh, and uh, uh, during uh, the collapse of the economy. And people who have um, been living through these things the most important for them is stability over everything. They are not interested in uh, Ukraine or wars or big that They are interested in stability, that they know what is going to happen tomorrow. Will they get the salary? Will the school be open? And this feeling inside people is very, very strong among the, uh, especially the older generation. The gentleman, please present yourself. Let's begin to the microphone. I'm Alexa, and um, 
First of all, I would like to thank you for your presentations. And uh, I was honestly hoping for more of... Uh, Keep Putin. microphone even. Okay. Yeah. I was hoping for uh, more of uh, life of Putin than uh, this one side of story of Putin's regime. Uh, as a speaker number one, or first speaker, I am sorry, I can't miss, uh, said uh, that uh, Putin's regime is going to be challenged, and uh, as a speaker two said that it's going to be confrontated. I'm wondering what do you mean by that? Also, when you say uh, democratization of Russia, what do you mean? Do you mean thereby uh, examples as Yugoslavia, Syria, Afghanistan, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Vietnam, or, and <laughs> so on. That's what I'm wondering. Also, um, I'm not really uh, into Chechenian war. I'm wondering, could you compare uh, Western uh, backing up uh, Chechenians uh, the way I as it was done in Syria uh, instead of backing up uh, Assad's regime? And also, I'm wondering if uh, weak Russia is good for West. Thank you. Yes, that's what a lot of uh, talent is and could be a, a, another introduction, but uh, I think I'll give the word to you, Mr. Sari, with some challenges. Well, there were a lot of, a lot of questions there. Um, <coughs> uh, the, the Try to limit your answer to a two, two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that the democratization for Russia means the rule of law in the country. The country now is lawless. And it really does mean the possibility of power changing hands. And uh, I think that a weak Russia is not good for the West, but uh, a, 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 a strong Russia has to be a country in which the regime doesn't fear the population and uh, is not uh, tempted to use the kind of repressive methods that could spiral out of control. So that's a, how's that for a brief, brief <laughs> answer? <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we move on to the next uh, question. <coughs> I have one question. And I'd like to ask <coughs> the panelists, what do they think is the ultimate national and international goal of Mr. Putin? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, Question, I uh, can start with you, Pavel uh, uh, Bav. Uh, what is the goal of the regime? Is it like to enrich themselves, or is it like this super Russia being a superpower again, or is it both? There are certainly many, uh, many goals advanced. And yes, there is a goal of uh, making Russia great again, uh, and there is a goal of uh, outplaying United States and international arena. But I think the, uh, the main underlying idea is, is to keep power, is regime survival. And that uh, determines may, many other goals, and that determines uh, behavior in, in, in many international crises. And that uh, regime survival is, th is seen as threatened, first of all, uh, not by external enemies, but by, by uh, color revolution. The ultimate threat to uh, non-democratic regimes is a revolution. And for the kind of Putin regime, um, that threat, that kind of specter of revolution, who is suddenly coming closer and suddenly departing again, I think that is uh, something which uh, drives its fears and drives its behavior vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and vis-a-vis vis -vis vis -vis Syria, which was, uh, which was mentioned, and, uh, and domestically as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that is, if you want one uh, de determinant of its behavior, it is a struggle for survival. Mm. Uh, Martin Toft, uh, uh, what yes, is the goal? I, I agree with that, but there is also one uh, very important thing for Putin, I think, and that is respect at the international scene. Uh, you can say that, oh, this is only personal and so on. But uh, I have followed him very closely. And for him personally, it's very, very important that he has some kind, that he gets some kind of respect. For example, I think Monday will be a great day for him in Paris. 
because you know he um, has very good cards before the negotiation about Ukraine and so on, and we will see a very self-confident uh, Putin uh, there. And this is personally very, very important for, uh, for uh, Vladimir Putin. Of course, if you are talking about him and the regime and so uh, it's, its right survival is very, very important for them. But um, I think also if you are talking about one word, respect is for Putin as a person very important. Mm -hmm. He will be respected at the international scene. It's very important for him to meet with international leaders and so on. But should we give him this respect? Should we give him? Yeah, should we re be reluctant to meet him? Some of the uh, Russian, this is Russian of course opposition this is, yes, is this arguing this. This is, of course, very interesting when we are talking, for example, about Norway, Russia. I have, as many know, following Finland very closely. And uh, I have talked to Mr. the President of Finland, Soli Niinistö, about this a couple of times. Why are you meeting Putin all the time? Uh, when, uh, for example, our Prime Minister has uh, actually, for four or five years then, been <coughs> uh, very restrictive to have meeting with Russia at the political high level. And he said it's very important, although we, are, uh, uh, we disagree, to meet and to talk. And uh, of course this is uh, also very important for, for Putin to get these kind of uh, meetings in a neighboring country. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Mr. Ninister is of course uh, uh, in line with the EU line uh, against Russia. But um, uh, he says to me, uh, Russia is too important for us not to talk to them. Mm. Mr. Sutter, anything to, to add? Or let me add the question here is that one of the biggest fears, as I understand it, for the Putin regime is a kind of Euromaidan uprising at the, the Red Square. Uh, yeah, definitely. Has yeah. he reason to fear it? Yeah, that, uh, that's the one thing that, uh, that he, he can't control because Euromaidan was spontaneous. It was self-organizing. It, uh, you know, if there, uh, in, in 1989, when the Article Six of the Constitution was eliminated, there were a million people on the street in Moscow. Uh, if you've got a crowd of a million people on the street, you know, tanks don't work anymore, uh, and. Um, Unless you're, unless you, well, it, de it depends uh, the, the level of slaughter that you're ready to, to envisage. But, but, but the, the, the danger is then that the, 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 that the army becomes unreliable. That's what they are fearing. As far as the respect is concerned, um, Baron, you know, I, uh, this, there's a, you know, in, in, in Dostoevsky, the murderer, returns to the scene of the crime. And uh, Putin has not forgotten the apartment bombings. And I think that psychologically, nor has he forgotten the other crimes of which he's been guilty and in which he's participated. And I think this is, when we talk about his desire for respect, he also has the, the habit of constantly showing up late for, for appo appointments, including appointments with the Pope, uh, who you would ex who, who is accustomed to being treated with respect, not to mention foreign leaders, uh, because he, he understands his own background. He understands his ties to organized crime. He understands his corruption. He understands the reasons why he was chosen by, by Yeltsin. Of course he wants respect. Mm. He wants the West to, you know, to demonstrate by their behavior that they have no, no conception who they're dealing with. And, uh, uh, but that doesn't mean that, that we are obliged to give it, and it doesn't mean that it's appropriate. Hmm. Uh, we are fast moving uh, out of time, so let me repeat no. the speaker's list. I have the gentleman sitting out there, yes, you, and the gentleman sitting there, and the lady just behind there, and two gentlemen behind there, and that's how many we receive time for. Yeah, <laughs> both of you recognize. So please be brief, and also the panelists have to be limit their, their time they use to answer. Please. Hello, my name is, hello, my name is Ulf Jørgensen. I was wondering, uh, there was a lot of some discussion about how, how we can talk to the Putin regime, and uh, is there anything we, we can talk about, uh, about them about? So, I mean, there was about the transition to maybe a new leader, because the, the way I see it, uh, even after the Cold War, it, the Soviet people you know, took away the communist dictatorship, but they, 
the sense of the country being a great power didn't, didn't pass. It still has this sense of being a great power. So even after Putin has left, you know, maybe you can say that, like, like swearing in church, surely continue to insist that NATO is the only security organization in, in Europe. Maybe we should discuss this more, more in, uh, in, in real terms, like uh, maybe some other security structure for Europe other than NATO. Yeah, uh, that could be an own topic and an own event. <coughs> I mean, Pavel Bav, you any ideas about the European security system and, and, and Russia? In, in a very limited answer. <laughs> yes, it is uh, uh, certainly uh, this feeling of uh, belonging to a great power uh, is very typical, is very strong uh, in Russia. It's shared widely in the society and in the ruling class. The only question is great how. Uh, uh, David quoted Alexander II, who once famously mentioned Russia had two, only two uh, friends, its army and its navy. And it you know, implies that now he's saying that Russia only has two enemies, uh, its culture and its education. <laughs> you know, that is a measure of greatness now. And I think you know, it is very important to shift the emphasis from the uh, confrontation with the military means to competition uh, in economy, in innovations, in, uh, in creating value, in, uh, in the, uh, I don't know, intellectual, inter artificial intelligence. That is the way where Russia has to prove its greatness. Mm. Uh, anything to add, or should we move on to the next well, question, David? Well, uh, no, I, 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 I think, and I've always said that, that uh, uh, the greatest, uh, the, the, the best way to, to, to deal with Russia is not with hostility, but simply with the truth. Uh, insist on the truth regarding the history. Insist on the, the true story. And, and don't allow yourselves to fall victim to their disinformation or their attempts. Uh, but this take, it takes intellectual ability. And you know, so many of the people, I can s tell you from the United States, so many of the people who deal with Russia deal with Russia superficially. And uh, you know, as someone who is considered a Russia specialist in the US State Department is someone who has been given a bunch of bureaucratic dossiers, may not speak a word of Russian, may not know the country at all, has, you know, understands the options that the government has, and has become, as a, as a result, a Russia specialist. But the you know that kind the, the uh, special uh, you know expertise at that level uh, indicate means that we will never really be able to uh, communicate with the regime or with the population of Russia, not to mention our own population, on the basis of what's really going on. Mm. Martin, uh, one of the most negative aspects with the new uh, Russian society is what you're talking about truth about history which is uh, really depressing now these days. For example, we uh, are now s celebrating uh, the, uh, the start of the Russian, the Soviet attack on, on Finland, 3rd of November, uh, 1939. And uh, for many years, actually, this was an open discussion between uh, Finnish and Russian historians about these uh, things. And uh, uh, they agreed that, uh, okay, uh, Soviet attacked Finland uh, during the Winter War, and then Finland attacked R Soviet uh, during um, uh, the Barbarossa. And there was some kind of agreement about that. But now, uh, <laughs> the Russians uh, are still presenting, for example, I think it was uh, on one of the official sites of the um, Military his uh, Historical Society in Moscow, they came back and said that the war was started by the Finns again. Yes. Which, of course, is a totally lie, and it's unnecessary because these things the, uh, we're talking about two countries where, uh, where they were talking about the history in an open way. The Finns did a lot of things during uh, the Second World War, which was not very good, and the Russians did their things. And people were talking about this discussion at the intellectual uh, uh, and uh, um, what you can say more uh, professional level. But now, unfortunately, these things are coming back, uh, and. Um, uh, this is, of course, for me as a person interested in history, very depressing. So uh, this is one of 
the negative aspects with the Russian society today. But of course, um, uh, it's true. In Russia today, things are changing. People are getting information from a lot of uh, other sources. TV is not that very important anymore. Uh, and people can, uh, can read about these things, uh, uh, not only from uh, the military historical society. So uh, that's, of course, a positive uh, thing going on in Russia today. People yeah. get uh, information from a lot of different sources. Mm. We take a couple of interventions from the audience now. First, the gentleman there, and also the lady who uh, signed on there. F you first. Uh, thank you, Chair. My name is uh, Kåre Erga. I am a retired Norwegian diplomat, main field of interest, Eastern Europe. Uh, I have really no quarrel with either of the panelists, and I just want to emphasize one aspect which you all to a smaller or larger extent touched upon, namely that Putin's regime disregard for their own people, their own nation. But is that really anything new? When we read the way the Tsars handled the um, populace, as it was called at that time, um, when we read about uh, Stalin's uh, excesses, um, May I remind you of a more a recent uh, story? In 1993-94, the Norwegian government put 300 million crowns to the disposal of the Russians for cleaning up their nickel factory in the town of Nickel. That money was never used because, as one of the Russian spokesmen said at the time, why on earth would we clean up nickel? where there are only 50,000 people living. We don't do anything about Norilsk. There is a million over there, and it's worse than in Nickel. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. And it's next, uh, next uh, speaker. It's never a million in yeah. yeah. Norilsk. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I have a couple of questions for Mr. Satter. Um, is regarding your presentation, there are a couple of concepts that I would like you to um, elaborate a bit further on. Uh, you started your presentation saying that the um, Soviet Union was um, a response to the, an anti-moral response to the transcendental morality of the West. Uh, I would like you to um, elaborate a bit more what is this transcendentality and what is this morality and when do you see this process starting? Is this something that starts in 1917 with the October Revolution? maybe before at the end of the 19th century with the first socialist movements during the, uh, the Tsarism or later on with the, with the Stalinism. And then there was another, uh, uh, by the end of your speech, um, you, mentioned, um, uh, you mentioned the presumption of innocence as being a uh, Anglo-Saxon concept. And I was a bit confused by this because even though it is true that the presumption of, of innocence is something that is in Anglo-Saxon common law, in Europe we actually receive it from the Corpus Juris Civilis, um, and this process of reception of Roman law is something that surely Russia was not excluded of. So I don't really see how this is something that matters, and I would like you to, to um, elaborate a bit further on these two concepts. Sure, there's a couple of challenges for you, Mr. Satter, and I would like to limit your answer to two minutes before we take the last two interventions from the audience, I which is I back I in there. I'm not, I'm not sure I, I quite grasp the, the question about the presumption of innocence. That's right? not only Anglo-Saxon. Uh, yeah, uh, that it's not only an uh, Anglo-Saxon. Yeah, of course, I mean, it's, uh, I, I was referring to it, uh, to its role in uh, Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence, but of course it's, uh, it's not limited to, to the, to the Anglo-Saxon world. Uh, the point here is that when you have a government that is able, you know, where the, the courts are controlled, where the prosecutor is controlled, where the police are controlled, where all evidence can be falsified, uh, you cannot say when you have evidence of an atrocity that, well, we can't prove it. Well, of course, you'll never be able to prove it. Uh, but when, the, but when the evidence is so over, over what the evidence that you are able to gather, despite the enormous resistance of the regime, is so overwhelming, the, and, and 
and when the when the, the regime responds to this evidence with countless lies and obstruction, uh, that that they cannot be extended the the presumption of innocence under those circumstances. Let's take the final two uh, interventions. The, the first one, yeah. Yeah, uh, Simon here, just pretty much a listener. Um, but what I'm wondering is, if I could just ask the entire panel and just get sort of a yes, no, or a short summary, but does Putin have the political power to form his own successor? Well, uh, that just keep that question in mind, and I'm sure they take it during the mm -hmm. final uh, final thoughts. And, uh, and uh, oh, let's take the final intervention then. The man all the way behind. Uh, just a short two questions: uh, uh, role of Vladislav Surkov in Putin's life, and the second future of uh, relations uh, between Russia and Turkey. Uh, in terms of NATO's presence in Eastern Europe? Well, that's also uh, uh, interesting final questions, which could be a, a, an own uh, event, but I think I'll, I'll provide you with a couple of minutes to have your closing statement, so I can start with you, Pavel, uh, uh, about Putin's successor and relationship between uh, Turkey and Russia. Two minutes. <laughs> yes, I am working a lot on the relationship between Turkey and Russia uh, professionally. And it's certainly, it is a very, uh, very peculiar kind of strategic partnership in which, in fact, a lot depends upon the personal uh, ties between Putin and Erdogan. Uh, and they love to demonstrate a particular chemistry of which, in fact, there is none. Uh, <laughs> there, is no, there is no love lost, no, no trust whatsoever. And I think for Putin in particular, uh, the relations with Erdogan are uh, overshadowed by the fact that for him, Erdogan embodies uh, political Islam. And that's something he spelled uh, during the crisis with the relations with Turkey uh, in, the, in, the late, uh, in the late of year 15. But uh, I think it is, it is, it's, it's always there, and you know, Putin is extremely sensitive to that, uh, um, to that matter. As for shaping the successor, I don't think it is anywhere in, in Putin's mind. I think he, um, he is stuck with that position. I don't think any chance for him to retire uh, peacefully. I don't think he would, he would po possibly trust anybody to be a reliable successor. That's a big difference with Yeltsin. Morten mm. Yantoft, your final thoughts? Well, you think that uh, this question about successor is not in his mind. I think it is in his mind all the time, but I also agree with you that <laughs> he, he so far he, he, um, he hasn't found anybody and he doesn't <laughs> trust anybody. And uh, he is trying out some people around him, but so far he hasn't found anybody. And uh, of course, this is, uh, this is the question in Moscow all the time now, although it's, uh, how many, it's four and a half years to the next elections. Okay. But I think things will happen before that. I don't know what will happen, but something will happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Doesn't sound good. <laughs> that, uh, yes, yes. No more elections. <laughs> what about uh, Vladislav uh, Surkov? Are you interested in him? It's very interesting, of course, uh, about... Uh, 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 originally Chechen sitting uh, so close to Putin and forming his poli policy against, for example, Ukraine. It's a very interesting person. I have been following him very closely all the time, all, read all the interviews with him. And of course, he is a very uh, 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 key person when we are talking about uh, everything about Putin, about image. And for example, he is the person who is actually handling the, 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 uh, the, the situation in Donbass from the Kremlin too. So uh, he is a very interesting p person. Uh, he, I, I think there is no uh, sign that he is losing any, uh, any, uh, any of his influ influence, but um, uh, I don't know what you will say, but, but he is uh, a key person when we are talking about Putin and Ukraine, for example. And uh, I think he is very working very hard this weekend to prepare the meeting in Paris uh, on Monday. Mm. Uh, closing statement, David, a couple of minutes. Uh, I don't think that Putin is, is giving a lot of thought to his successor. Uh, after many years in power, he understands that 
uh, there are many things that can be used against him once he loses power. And uh, we saw what happened after the death of Stalin, who was also in power for many years. Those who seemed to be his most loyal uh, henchmen uh, turned out to, ex to be the ones to expose his crimes in their own interests. And there'll be an enormous uh, advantage for whoever uh, succeeds Putin in discrediting him. Uh, and Putin, I think, is, is wise enough, any Russian leader would be, to, to appreciate this fact. Uh, they've, uh, there's, they're, they're, the, it, the West may not have had much success in investigating what Putin did. But uh, people inside the regime know and, uh, and are, are in a position to expose it. Before uh, we end, let me just end with this note. And uh, on behalf of the Atlant Norwegian Atlantic Committee and Svita, thank everybody for coming. Uh, feel free to check out atlantavskomiteen.no and svita.no for many interesting events, certainly coming next year. Uh, I've seen a lot of you before, but there's also room for new people attending our meetings. And also, thank you to the panel for sharing your thoughts. Have a great evening. <laughs>